Good afternoon and welcome to Sundays in Swanee. My name is Denise Osier and I'm in charge of adult services for the library. Today we have Michael and Matthew Carson, best-selling, award-winning father and son writing team. Very unusual. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. They are most well known for their publications, African American Inventions That Changed the World, Today in African American History, and African American Musicians That Changed Music Forever. Growing up in Queens, Michael has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Virginia State University, and he works as a government analyst. And Matthew is in elementary school, well, really middle school. Yeah, right. This bio says um, oh, elementary, OK. Student who enjoys researching and writing about history. You're very tall for an elementary school. <laughs> Student. Yeah. I was definitely thinking middle school, maybe high school. Yeah. But whatever it is, you're young to be an author. So we're sure glad you're here. Help me welcome our guest today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Michael A. Carson. This is my son, Matthew Carson. And uh, we're happy to be here to talk about our newest book, uh, How Did Black History Month Begin? Preserving the Legacy of African American History. Uh, this journey began um, really back in 2017. Uh, we have written together and collaborated on three books together since then. Um, our first book was African American Inventions That Changed the World, followed by our second book, or the first book, I'm sorry, it covers uh, 42 inventors who did some pretty incredible things. Uh, a lot of these inventors are not household names, but they have invented things that we use every day. The uh, traffic light, the mailbox, the light bulb, um, the uh, home security system, pretty much all things we use today uh, are by these inventors mentioned in the book. Our second book, Today in African American History, covers every single day of the year, um, pretty much, and I included the leap year day, 366 days, and it mentions events and accomplishments that occurred on that particular date. Our third book is actually the first one we collaborated on, and it has uh, both of us as authors. We uh, used to get into um, debates in the car about great musical artists, so we decided to work and collaborate on a book together. It's African American Musicians That Changed Music Forever, 100 Legendary Artists, who created the soundtracks of our lives. So after writing that third book, uh, last year when Juneteenth became an observed federal holiday, Matthew came to me and asked me, how did Black History Month begin? So I gave him a short answer, and we started doing a little research together. And in that research, he asked, Dad, can we write a book about it? So that's what brought us to our fourth book, how did Black History Month begin, preserving the legacy of African American history? So this is a very interesting book because we learned so much that we didn't know. We decided to um, collaborate, put it on paper, and just educate the world. So it all began with this person, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, he was known today as the father of black history. Um, one of his quotes is, no, no man knows what he can do until he tries. He was really ahead of his time, and he was just a brilliant person. I'll uh, read a little bit from the introduction. Uh, the month of February has marked the celebration of Black History Month for more than half a century, an annual observance that recognizes and highlights the achievements and countless contributions of African Americans. The yearly commemoration would not exist today if it wasn't for educator and historian Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Um, he devoted most of his life shining a light on the accomplishments of African Americans throughout history. 
So it all began with Dr. Carter G. Woodson, and today we're going to explain exactly what he did and the steps that he took to make February today as we celebrate Black History Month. So Dr. Carter G. Woodson, just to give you a little history of who he is, uh, born Dr. Carter Godwin Wilson. He was born on December 19th, 1875 in New Kenton, Virginia. His story began in a similar fashion, a countless number of African Americans who were still coming of age during the difficult days of Reconstruction uh, as a son of formerly enslaved parents. Um, his parents were both illiterate and um, his parents both helped Union soldiers during the Civil War, and he supported the family as a farmer. So um, that's kind of where he began, his story began. Um, going through high school, he went to um, uh, Frederick Douglass High School in Virginia, and he enrolled in a doctoral program at Harvard. He is actually the second person after W.E.B. Du Bois to earn a uh, PhD uh, for the doctorate program at Harvard. So um, that is a little history on Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Now, <clears throat> during his days at Harvard, um, he graduated from a progressively, um, relative progressive Harvard University. Uh, he was motivated in his embarked journey to uh, make African-American history both visible and um, appreciated throughout the country. Uh, contemporary historians during that time, they uh, had a very narrow scope of African-American history during those times, and their, their perspective was kind of limited. When he was a student in school, they really didn't talk about black history, and they, um, his professors said that African-Americans really didn't contribute much to history, so he went on an educational journey to prove his predecessors wrong. Um, he was determined throughout his life to shine a light on African American um, historical figures that did bring something to the historical table. Uh, he knew what the impact and the takeaway would be if future students and everyday people would learn the stories of Phyllis Wheatley and uh, Benjamin Banneker. So these are people that he took it upon himself to learn about. Uh, Phyllis Wheatley was the uh, first African-American published author in the United States in 1773. Uh, George Washington actually looked at some of her poems and he personally um, complimented her on what of a great poet she was. Uh, Benjamin Banneker in um, 1753, he also had an experience with George Washington. He was a surveyor and an inventor. Uh, George Washington actually came to him when he moved the nation's capital from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., and he was one of the surveyors. So he was responsible for designing some of the layouts and buildings in Washington, D.C. that's still there today. So these are some of the people that Dr. Woodson was learning about that no one, everyday people didn't know anything about. So he decided to learn more about these people and write about them. Uh, he also learned of early influencers like Thomas Jennings. He was the first African-American man to receive a patent in the United States. In 1821, believe it or not, he invented dry cleaning. <laughs> uh, dry cleaners have been the cornerstone of every neighborhood throughout the country and the world. And it all started with um, Thomas Jennings. He also learned about Alexander Miles, who invented the modern day elevator back in 1887. Um, these two men were kind of not really household names and well known. But Dr. Carter shined a light on some of these individuals, and he wanted them to be well known throughout the world. Uh, other early influencers was um, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, and Harriet Tubman. 
Um, this book kind of just highlights how Dr. Carter wanted these individuals well known and he wanted more people to learn about them. He also learned five years prior to him being born uh, that they were actually back in the early 1870s congressmen and senators who are African-American. A lot of people don't really know this part of history, but after Reconstruction, when the 14th Amendment of the Constitution was amended, it gave voting rights to all citizens. And throughout that time, a lot of African-American formerly enslaved people had the ability to vote. So they, they voted in a lot of members of Congress and the Senate also. And you know, this is five years prior to Dr. Carter being born, and he didn't even know these things. A, a lot of people during that time did not. So he was also coming of age, this is after the turn of the 20th century, where he began learning about W.E.B. Du Bois, and also he learned about um, Ida B. Wells. These two individuals helped established the NAACP. And this was kind of the people around Dr. Woodson's generation. So together, around this time, uh, around the 19, 1920s, Dr. Woodson decided he's going to um, establish a weekly journal to document a lot of these um, historical figures who did incredible things, but it wasn't really known to the average American person. So he compiled all his information and would add it into a weekly journal. He took that information and he wrote a book. The name of the book was The Education of the Negro Prior to 1861. And he has also established an organization called the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. That um, organization is still around today, and that was started by Dr. Woodson here. Um, the book that he wrote uh, kind of highlighted his experience during that time it emphasized the importance and power of the African-American story abroad. He detailed why African-Americans was not being taught during the time. He also explained the historical, historically, enslavers were responsible for preventing enslaved people from receiving proper education in order to kind of force them into subordination. And he knew once people would learn about their history, it would kind of empower them to want to learn more and do you know, things in their life that they didn't think possible. So he continued with this book and his journals. And during this time, it was around the Harlem Renaissance. And he was coming of age with people like Langston Hughes and Alan Locke. He learned um, about, it was called the Negro Movement and better known as the Harlem Renaissance. And it marked the time when mainstream publishers turned their attention seriously to African-American literature, music, art, and politics. The cultural movement was greatly stimulated by his weekly journals, and he published, he published them, you know, and tried to send them to HBCUs and get the ball rolling on them learning more about their history. He also learned about Betsy Coleman. Um, she was the first African-American to receive a pilot's license. In, she didn't receive it in the United States. Um, during that time, there was a lot of um, uh, things with women. They weren't as empowered as men to do things like get licenses, so she took her experience to France, and she actually received her license in France and came back to America, and she was recognized as being the first African-American woman to receive a pilot's license. 
He also learned about people like Madam C.J. Walker. Uh, Madam C.J. Walker is known today as the first self-made African-American millionaire. She made her fortunes with um, uh, uh, healthcare products, not healthcare, but beauty products for women. And she made an absolute fortune. Going door to door, she employed an army of, of uh, hair care beauticians. And some of her products are still around today. So throughout his years of research, Dr. Carter um, implemented something called Negro History Week in 1926. What he did was once a week, once a year, he highlighted African-American accomplishments. And um, he wanted it brought mainstream. He picked the second week of February to coincide with and pay homage to the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. He credited the two with ending slavery in America. And a lot of people today, like Matthew asked me back then, why do we celebrate Black History Month in February? It all started in 1926 with Negro History Week. And that's the reason. He picked their two birthdays as a starting point to celebrate the accomplishments of African Americans. By this time, he wrote a second book, The Miseducation of the Negro. One of his uh, famous quotes from that book is, um, when you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. Um, you don't have to tell him to go stand or go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You need not to send him to the back door, he will go there being untold. In fact, there is no back door. He will protest until it's made for his use. His education makes it necessary. So that was one of his famous quotes from that book. During this time, uh, we were getting into the 1930s and Dr. Carter would highlight the Negro um, League and uh, famous athletes were coming of age. Jesse Owens and um, there were a couple of other athletes during that time but I wanted to highlight Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis. Uh, Jesse Owens and Lewis actually have an interesting story about them. Uh, of course uh, in 1936 the Olympics was hosted by Nazi Germany and Hitler and Jesse Owens ran in that Olympics. He totally shattered every world record in track and field. And a little known history fact about him is that um, there was a person who started the Adidas footwear, was at that Olympic Games. He was unknown at that time. Uh, what I found out is we, we pronounce Adidas wrong. It's really Adidas. That was the guy's last name. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's name was Addy. His first name was Addy, and his last name was Dassler. So it was Addy Das. And he visited the Olympic Village that Jesse was in, and he begged and pleaded Jesse, can you please wear my new footwear um, while you're running track? And that's kind of what brought light to his Adidas footwear. So Jesse was the first person to have what they call today a sneaker contract or a sneaker deal. <laughs> um, Joe Lewis also during that time was actually one of the first American um, heroes in sports. He was the heavyweight champ and um, he had one of the longest running reigns in history. He defended his title more than 25 times. Um, his first loss was to a um, German boxer named Max Schmeling. And um, when he was beat by uh, Max Schmeling, Hitler told the world that Aryan su uh, superiority reigns over the world and uh, German boxers proved it by beating Joe Lewis. 
So they had a rematch schedule two years later in 1938 in Yankee Stadium. And the fate of the world actually changed since then because World War I started and the rematch uh, was very highly anticipated. Um, Hitler's army already invaded <clears throat> Europe and there was 80,000 fans packed in Yankee Stadium to view the fight. Um, as Lewis entered the ring, he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. Um, he wasn't just fighting for himself, he was fighting for his country and the world. And um, it morphed into not even a boxing match, but Roosevelt was the president at that time versus Hitler. So um, the fight was very anticipated. And um, Lewis defeated Schmeling in the first round with a devastating knockout, and he was hailed as the first American national hero in sports during that time. So Dr. Carter felt it very important to highlight these individuals in his weekly journal. And um, the entertainment industry was also very big during that time. Um, this is Hattie McDaniel. She's the first African American to win an Academy Award. Um, she won the award in 1940 and She's also the first African-American woman to sing on the radio. She was big in the film industry. She uh, appeared in over 300 motion pictures, and she was a star before her time. She's the only person, I believe, to have two stars in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. One is for her contributions to radio, and the other one is from the motion picture industry. So, we also, during the time of the war, he highlighted the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, he felt it was very important to highlight and make sure people knew that African-American um, fighter pilots were going to protect our country during World War I as well. Which brings us to the 1940s. Um, everyone should be familiar with this person. We're getting into people we're familiar with now. Jackie Robinson, of course, on April 15th, broke the uh, color barrier um, in 1947 in the major leagues. Baseball was a national pastime. It was the most uh, popular sport in the country during that time. So um, he's probably one of the people who needs no introduction. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Carter felt it very important to highlight uh, Jackie Robinson. As we go on, during this time, going into the 1960s, um, Dr. Carter had unfortunately passed away, but his legacy continued. Um, Negro History Week was still going on every year since 1926, and there, were, uh, there was something new in the United States brewing in the 1950s and 1960s. It was called the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, Thurgood Marshall became the first African-American uh, Supreme Court Justice during that time. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was making headways himself as one of the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. And um, during this time, it was the March on Washington in the 1960s. Um, these three ladies uh, had a movie made about them a couple of years ago, known as The Hidden Figures. Um, mathematicians Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson all played a critical role in providing data that was essential for the su success of the US space program in the 1960s. During this time, going into the late 60s and early 70s, Music also played an important role in bridging the gap during the time um, there was a lot of segregation going on. But sports and music were really the two things to bring our country together and people really started getting along. Uh, Motown Records was massive in that bridge. Um, people really started enjoying music together. They would go to concerts together they would become friends off of a lot of the music that they heard during that time. Um, uh, 
As Motown artists began touring the country, concert audiences were often segregated during the performances. People often couldn't find the common, uh, anything in common outside of the music, but it brought them together with their love of music, you know, as a whole. The Motown sound had the power to make people forget their differences and come together and sing and dance. Um, during the 1960s, songs of freedom began to ring out during the civil rights movement. And Motown artists began writing more socially conscious music that motivated and inspired people to fight for equal rights and justice. And everyone probably knows who this guy is as well. <laughs> Uh, in the 1960s, we were all introduced to an 18-year-old boxer named Cassius Clay. He won the uh, gold medal at the um, U.S. Olympics in Rome. And, um, you know, he became uh, world-renowned not as only as a boxer, but a, um, a civil rights activist and just an activist for all people. He wanted equal rights for everyone um, during his time as champion as an as a, uh, activist. Um, the 1960s also brought uh, Shirley Chisholm, who's not really well known, but she's the first African-American woman to be um, elected to the U.S. Congress. A little known fact is she also was the first African-American person, well, not person, but woman to run for president back in the uh, 1960s. She opened the door for many um, female um, politicians today. It all started with uh, Shirley Chisholm back in the 1960s. So that brings us to the 1970s. And um, for close to five decades now, Carter G. Woodson's organization um, was celebrating Negro History Week. And um, during that time, in 1969, the student organization named Black United Students on the campus of Kent State University, they celebrated uh, the first ever Black History Month that took place on their campus in February. Um, along with Kent State's annual celebration becoming increasingly popular, the Civil Rights Movement began producing several iconic heroes during that time, and growing awareness of African-American pride and identity soon evolved into Black History Month. So they kind of set the stage on what Black History Month is today. And um, in 1976, President Gerald Ford urged Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of African-Americans in everyday um, during that month. He wanted more and more people to learn more about the history during that month. Uh, since then, each president, each American president has issued um, Black History Month proclamations in the month of February. And Black History Month is, um, sort of took off of there. It was officially recognized in 1976 as the um, 200th anniversary of America. And uh, it was one of those things where it was America's birthday on a bicentennial. And it was also um, something that was beginning for Black History Month in February. So it all started with the gentleman on the right, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. This was his ultimate dream as uh, growing up as a student and being a Harvard-educated um, scholar. Today, Black History Month is celebrated in Canada, the United Kingdom, Germany, the Netherlands. Uh, they all joined the United States in bringing awareness to the many contributions um, of people of African descent. Um, the United States and the rest of the world then created a monthly celebration similar to Black History Month. So, that's pretty much how Black History Month began. I took you on a journey from the early days of Reconstruction till today. And, you know, that's what me and Matthew learned when we um, did uh, a lot of um, research in the book. And those are some of the people we highlighted in the book during that time. 
So that's our story. <laughs> So we just wanted to open up for questions, yes. Matthew, have you considered or uh, are you planning to write your own book? Um, I, I don't really know yet. I may write a book in the future, but for now I'm just co-writing co with my dad. Well, comment, I just think it's very remarkable that both of you combined, you were asking your dad some great questions that led to some great books. <laughs> and I heard that question asked so many times, particularly about who started Black History Month. I think that's a question so many want to know and did not know. And now they have a way to learn more about Carter G. Woodman. So kudos, a great job by both of you. Absolutely, that's one of the number one questions is, why is it in February and how did it begin in the first place? So the book pretty much breaks it down and lets everyone know. How did you do your research? Uh, we spent many hours in the Gwinnett County Library System. <laughs> we would um, mostly over the weekend go to the library and we got our hands on as many books as we could about black history. And uh, we really took an interest in learning who Carter G. Woodson was. A lot of books were written about him, and we took out and highlighted a lot of things that uh, we felt was important for the book. And um, we spent hours uh, at night and on the weekend taking what we learned and bringing it to the computer and, and writing it. And what are you guys working on next? <laughs> Um, next, we are working on um, a book that probably is going to maybe highlight a lot of, um, because during our research or the books that we did, we learned so much about people who are not really known to the world, but they did incredible things. Um, so that would probably be our next project to work on together. Yes. Do you guys travel the world when you um, like when doing something like this as well in other countries, other states? Well, we don't travel the world, but we okay. do travel other states, and we've had a lot of um, book signings. We have met um, a lot of fantastic people along the way, um, including um, Mr. Mike Glenn in the audience. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we have. Um, we met Kamala Harris. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's when she was running for president. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. We we've, we've met Kamala Harris. Um, she's actually highlighted in one of the books, and Matthew ran up to her and told her, "My dad highlighted you in his book." <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Matt. Way to go. <laughs> and they had like a 15-minute conversation, oh. <laughs> and um, he signed her book for her. And uh, she, uh, they, they kind of hit it off. <laughs> and um, we have uh, just met so many fantastic people along the way. We uh, have done a lot of book signings at Barnes and Noble okay. in different states. Okay. And so we have been traveling. Okay. Any other questions? Um, for Matthew, Matthew, what advice would you give to other kids your age that want to write a book? Um, maybe like, if you want to write a book, you're gonna have to do like a lot of research and stuff. There's gonna be like a lot of work to like write books and stuff, and you're just gonna have to do a lot of research on the topic you want to write on. For both of you, I'd like to know if you have a favorite person throughout all your study in black history, whether it's music or uh, his, history with scholarly work, do you have a favorite person in black history, either, either in both of you? Um, I think my favorite person probably Frederick Douglass, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, That's your favorite person? Yeah. My favorite person is actually someone I learned about last week. Um, her name was Henrietta Lacks. Um, Oprah really uh, recently made a movie about her, 
But she was a person back in the 1940s. She went to the um, hospital. She had uh, cervical cancer. And the doctor did a, uh, a biopsy on her and um, got um, a sample of her cells. And during this time, it was without her knowledge and out without her consent, he sent it to a, uh, the, the lab. And the person in the lab found her cells were remarkable. They would repl replicate every 24 hours. Now, the average person's cells die within a couple of days. Since the 1940s, her cells have been replicating since then, and they've used them to cure polio. They've used them to cure a lot of diseases since that time. And she, she unfortunately passed away that same year, but her family never knew. Mm. And um, they didn't find out to 20 years later, and her cells were used by researchers who've made millions of dollars off of them. And um, her, it was a, a, a person who learned about it in a school, a writer. She contacted her daughter, and Oprah played the daughter in the movie. And um, her daughter found out, and they brought awareness around it. So that was just fascinating to me to learn about. So, yes. What was one of your biggest challenges while completing the project? Um, the biggest challenge for me was, you know, when you write a book with so many facts in it or so many moving parts, it's like taking a big puzzle of a hundred pieces and putting them together. The, the challenge to me was like taking each fact and where to put it and when you put it there, what do you talk about there and what do you cover after that? You know, writing a book is kind of like putting a big puzzle together. It's, very challenging at times, and um, it's, um, it, it requires a lot of patience and a lot of uh, late nights. <laughs> Did you want to answer that also? <laughs> Any other questions? Why did you also gravitate towards black history? That actually began with our story back in um, 2017. Matthew was in the second grade at that time. And he came to me uh, one Black History Month and asked, he was working on a school project. So I helped him with inventors. Um, and I learned so many things I didn't even know. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, you know, I grew up in uh, New York City. And when we had black history projects for February, we only learned about Martin Luther King and Harriet Tubman and uh, Rosa Parks, and it kind of ended there. So when I helped him, uh, we just did a ton of research and we you know, found out so many things we didn't know, we decided to write that first book about it. And in that first book, it just kind of spiraled into more projects. What made you guys think to do some things outside of February? I'm glad you did, but what, what led to your thinking that maybe you could promote this book in June? Well, um, in June, the, um, you know, Black History Month expands, you know, outside of the month. And June, we... Um, Black Music Month. We celebrate Juneteenth, and also June, uh, a lot of people not aware that June is Black Music Month. It was established here in Georgia by President Jimmy Carter back in um, 1979, I believe. And um, it it's highlights a lot of musicians and artists that have come along since that time. And, um, you know, we just feel that that, that's kind of what led to that second book. It covers every day of the year. We feel that it's just important just to learn a f fun fact every day. Well, the book about Henrietta Lacks, I read it when it first came out. It's here at the library. It is an award-winning book. And her family never benefited one cent. In fact, they were quite impoverished despite the fact that millions and millions of dollars have been made 
because of her cells. So I encourage you also to read that book. Um, before we close, because this video will be up on the library's playlist, our YouTube channel author playlist, Michael, would you mention to the guests um, how they can get a copy of your books? Absolutely. You can uh, purchase a copy of any of my books and Matthew's books on Amazon.com. You just type in Michael A. Carson and the four titles should pop right up. Uh, some copies are also available at local Barnes & Noble stores here. Uh, we don't have a website, we just use Amazon. And there are copies available here, two of you like. And he'd be happy to sign them for you. Please help me thank you, our, our son and father writing combo. Come on up and meet them. <laughs>